Greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen. We'll begin our studies of the history of the monotheistic world religions, and we'll start it with uh, the history behind Judaism. Why Judaism first? Well, in chronological order of historical development, Judaism develops before the other two, before Christianity and before Islam. Thus, we'll start with Judaism to keep it in good order. Now, as we examine the history behind Judaism, uh, how are we going to play this? And really, this is the same model that we'll use with each of the other two religions. We'll start always on this screen on the left-hand side there with uh, the symbol associated with that religion. On the left-hand side at the top, you should see the candles that are the menorah, which are used during the celebration of Hanukkah for the people of Jewish faith. More importantly there in the background, you should also see the Star of David. The Star of David is the main symbol associated with Judaism. Now, as we continue to study Judaism, we're going to look at the geography. Uh, in what part of the world did this religion originate? Additionally, where do most followers of Judaism live today? So where can you find them today? Where did the religion begin? Where are they now? Uh, then we'll get into a, sort of a real basic history of the creation of this religion. We'll look at the founder of the Jewish faith, and then we will look at the very basic traditional history behind the foundation of this particular faith, in this case, Judaism. And we'll wrap up with a little something that I call just the basics. Uh, and we'll very briefly go through some of the very basic beliefs and facts regarding the, the Jewish faith. And that's the same thing we'll do with the other religions as well. Thus, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. Now, people of the Jewish faith can be found in many parts of the world, but the largest concentration of followers of Judaism can be found in the country of Israel. When you look at this map here that shows all the other religions, uh, notice uh, how minuscule uh, the percentage of the Judaic faith is compared to the others. That is because of the major monotheistic religions, Judaism is the smallest. Now, Jewish traditional beliefs state that Judaism was founded by a man named Abraham. And Abraham is said to have lived in Mesopotamia, in the Fertile Crescent, sometime in the 2000s BC. Now, there's no way to prove whether or not Abraham existed. Uh, all three major monotheistic religions do look to Abraham as a traditional ancestor, but there's no, outside of the religious writings, there's no evidence uh, of his existence. It becomes simply a matter of faith. Now, as the founder of Judaism, Abraham is considered to be the father of the Jewish people. And again, as I said, he's connected to the other two monotheistic religions as well. Now, in this period in history, Judaism would be incredibly unique because the vast majority of ancient cultures and ancient religions were all polytheistic. Uh, the Jewish people would be incredibly unique because they are monotheistic, worshiping only one God in a polytheistic world. And speaking of God, uh, Jews call God Yahweh. Now, interestingly enough, the God that Jewish people call Yahweh is the same God the Christians call God and the same God that Muslims call Allah. So Jews call God Yahweh, and they believe that in the 2000s BC, uh, God came to Abraham and made an agreement or a covenant with him. And according to Jewish tradition, this agreement stated that God would make a great nation out of Abraham and his descendants if they remained faithful to God. And it is said in Jewish tradition that at this point, Abraham left his home in the city of Ur, traveled the Fertile Crescent, and moved to the land that God supposedly promised to give to him and his descendants, the land of Canaan, or what is today the present-day country of Israel. According to Jewish tradition, Abraham had children here in, uh, in Canaan, uh, and his son, Jacob, also known as Israel, excuse me, his grandson Jacob, also known as Israel, had 12 sons of his own who then each went on to lead their own family group or tribe. Uh, now these 12 family groups or tribes would become the mythic 12 tribes of Israel that would populate the promised land, as they would call it, or the land of Canaan. Now, as time goes on, according to Jewish tradition, uh, a severe famine gripped the region that they lived in, gripped the land of Canaan, perhaps drought, uh, perhaps plague of locusts. Either way, there was a famine, and uh, the people left their homeland in Canaan, and they moved to Egypt, a very nearby place with very fertile lands. According to Jewish beliefs, by the 1200s BC, the Jews who had moved to Egypt had somehow become slaves. Uh, however, a prophet and very important person in the uh, Jewish faith, a guy by the name of Moses, uh, sort of goes head to head with the Egyptian pharaoh, secures the release and freedom of the Jewish people, and leads them on an exodus or a departure from captivity. 
The Exodus is celebrated by the Jewish people today in the religious celebration of Passover. And uh, the Torah, that's the holy book of the Jewish faith, says that during the Exodus, God gave to Moses ten commandments or ten laws or rules for the people to live by. In actuality, there aren't ten. There's actually 613. It's just that Christians and other Westerners only accepted ten of them, so that's where we get the idea that there were only ten commandments, when in reality there were way more than 600 of them. And and it was more of, a, you know, the, the ten commandments are not just religious rules, but they were also laws, politically binding laws for the people to live by. So the Ten Commandments are actually the 613 commandments, and they're not just religious commandments, but also political laws supposedly handed down by God to Moses for the people to live by. Now, according to Jewish tradition, Moses doesn't make it back to the promised land. He doesn't make it back to Canaan. He dies before he gets there, as do all of the other Israelites uh, who engaged in the original exodus. But it is their ancestors who finally return to the promised land, the homeland of Canaan. And so according to Jewish tradition, after Moses' death, a man named Joshua succeeds him as the leader of the Israelites. And he leads them back into Canaan after Moses has died. And this period of Jewish scripture and Jewish history is particularly bloody and violent because in the scriptures, in the Torah, in the writings, for the next 200 years or so, the Israelites will fight the local people, the Philistines and the Canaanites, for control of the land. And uh, the Jewish traditional stories are now pockmarked with stories of war, stories of siege of cities, slaughters of entire populations in order for the uh, Israelites to reclaim the land that they believe was their promised land. Kind of like we mentioned earlier, with the sociology of religion, different religions using their beliefs to justify violence. And in this particular case, you have this religious belief that the land was promised to them, and thus they're using that belief as a means for violence to reclaim that land. Well, they're incredibly successful because by 1020 BC, uh, the Israelites have united into one kingdom under a king named Saul. Saul was then later succeeded by the very famous uh, uh, Israelite king David of the David and Goliath fame. David turns Israel into an even greater kingdom, uh, and for that great kingdom, he builds a new capital city called Jerusalem, which, if Jewish tradition is to be accepted as true, uh, is the modern-day city of Jerusalem that still stands today. Now, by 922 BC, the Israelite kingdom built by David has now split into two separate kingdoms. And what we see at this point in history is really uh, that, that the story of Judaism is a story of freedom and independence followed by bondage, followed by freedom and independence, followed by more bondage under the control of others. Because this Israelite kingdom that had split into two will eventually be conquered by the new power in the region, the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians would conquer and destroy part of the, uh, part of the Jewish kingdom uh, and enslave some of the people until the Assyrians were then conquered by the Babylonians, who finished off the Jewish kingdom and took all of them as slaves back home to Babylon, where they remained until along came the Persians, who conquered the Babylonians. And when the Persians conquered Babylon, because the Persians did not believe in slavery, supposedly they freed the Jewish slaves and sent them back home to their homeland in Canaan. And there, uh, they continued to live freely in an independent kingdom until, wait for it, somebody else comes along, Alexander the Great, who conquers all of the Persian Empire, including Jerusalem and the land of Canaan. And uh, after Alex Alexander's empire fell apart, uh, the uh, Jewish kingdom would remain under the control uh, of the Seleucid Empire as part of the, uh, the old Greek lands. And when the Seleucid king, as it is uh, written by the, uh, by the Jewish traditional beliefs, when the Seleucid king, uh, Antiochus IV, tries to force the Jews to give up their religion and worship the Greek gods, they rebel. If we remember, this was one of the goals of uh, Alexander and the Greeks to sort of assimilate Greek culture and spread Greek culture, and Antiochus tries to do this by getting rid of the monotheistic faith of the Jews and trying to replace it with the polytheism of the Greeks. Again, story of freedom to bondage to freedom back to bondage again, uh, and we see that now the Jewish people rebel against uh, the Greeks, against, the, uh, against Antiochus in his attempt to force them to accept 
the uh, Greek religion. The rebellion is led by a man named Judah Maccabee and his brothers, and they succeed in defeating and expelling the Greeks from their lands and reestablishing an independent Jewish kingdom that would continue to exist until it was conquered by somebody else, and that would be the Romans, in 63 BC. So again, we see the pattern of freedom and independence, bondage, freedom and independence, back again to bondage. Well, the Jewish celebration of the uh, religious holiday of Hanukkah is actually a remembrance of this event. It's the remembrance of the Maccabee Rebellion uh, and the, uh, the, the, the re-consecrating of the temple and the saving of their monotheistic faith. That's the celebration of Hanukkah, remembering the Maccabee Rebellion. All right, so that's, that's where we're going to leave the history off, and now we're going to jump into just the facts, the basic facts about Judaism. Okay, uh, really sort of just list off a litany of things here. The holiest city in Judaism is Jerusalem, the city that they believed was built by David. They call it the city of David in some regards as a capital to his kingdom. So for the Jewish people, Jerusalem is the holiest city in their country. And, and, uh, and, and the, the city is located in the present-day country of Israel. And according to the Torah, the land of Canaan, which we have already discussed here, which is the present-day land of Israel, is the land that Jews believe God promised to give to Abraham and his descendants. So the land, the city, the whole place is incredibly important, religious, and holy to these folks. Uh, people of the Jewish faith worship their religion in temples that are called synagogues. And uh, the holiest site in all of the Jewish faith is a place called the Western Wall. Uh, and, that, I mean, it's literally what the name says. It's a wall, okay? The Western Wall is just a wall, but it's not just a wall. You see, the history behind the wall is what's important. An Israelite king by the name of Solomon, years ago, built a huge temple to God in the capital, Jerusalem. Uh, eventually, the temple was destroyed, first by the Babylonians, then it was rebuilt in the first century A.D., before it was finally destroyed for good by the Romans uh, in the year 70 A.D. When the Romans destroyed the temple, they took apart the whole thing, uh, except for part of the walls. And, and one of those walls, the one on the western side of the temple, was one of the surviving walls. And since it's the last surviving wall of what had been the holiest site, the holiest temple in all of the Jewish faith, that last wall remains to be the holiest site today. And so the last remaining wall of the temple, the western wall, is thus the holiest site in all of Judaism. On the right here, you can see this is supposedly what the original Holy Temple would have looked like uh, in the first century AD when it was constructed before the Romans destroyed it. And uh, here we see all that's left, and that is the Western Wall. Uh, literally, like I said, it's a wall, but it's all that remains of their holiest temple, thus making it the holiest site in all of Judaism. The Jewish holy book of scriptures is something that's called the Torah. The Torah from Hebrew literally translates into the writings. The Torah consists of what are, for Christians anyway, the first five books of the Bible, as well as the writings of the Jewish prophets. There's a lot of connection between Judaism and Christianity, and for the Christians, their Old Testament is basically the Jewish Torah. So if you're not familiar with Judaism, but you are with Christianity, the Old Testament of the Christian Bible is basically the Jewish Torah. Now, in these scriptures, the writings of the prophets and the Torah, uh, the Jewish scriptures promise that God would one day send a Messiah, who is going to bring peace, justice, and unity to the earth. Uh, Messiah means a, a deliverer. And for Jewish people, they believe that that Messiah has not yet come. They believe that this Messiah is still on the way one day. Christians, on the other hand, and here's this connection between Judaism and Christianity, Christians, on the other hand, believe that this Messiah was Jesus and that that person has already come. Jews, on the other hand, do not believe this, and they are still awaiting the arrival of this Messiah supposedly promised by the Torah and by the prophets. Okay, so there you have it with Judaism. We looked at the geography. Uh, we examined where Judaism originated, as well as where many of today's followers of Judaism live. We saw the founder of Judaism, Abraham, and then we looked at the basic traditional history behind the foundation of this religion. We finished off with just the basics, some really basic facts and beliefs uh, regarding the Jewish faith. So hold on to all of these essential questions and be ready to discuss them the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.